So we recently hit 20,000 subscribers on this channel. And to celebrate, I asked for your questions for a special Q&A show. And we got so many questions come in, so thank you to everybody who asked a question. And thank you for being here. I'm so grateful for all of you. We have such a lovely little community here. And the best part of my day is discussing books, discussing these great books, these great ideas with lovers of literature like you. I'm going to answer as many questions as possible and some will even have their own dedicated videos. So thank you again and let's dive right in. Any thoughts on the banning or censorship of literature? Do you think any books should be banned for writing about controversial topics or that no matter the topic, books should be accessible or somewhere in between. Yes, we had a really fascinating discussion in the book club uh, very recently on this very topic. We had a video go up about whether it is ever okay to ban, censor, or burn a book. And we're talking about this because, of course, James Joyce's Ulysses features in one of the most notorious obscenity trials of all time. And so this is a conversation that's very much in our minds as we move through that book, but it's a question that we always ask. It sounds like a current question, doesn't it? It sounds contemporary, but we're always asking about this and we're always expressing anxiety, or at least anxiety is always surfacing in art and anxiety about being silenced. And I think it's interesting that when you look to censorship or when you look to banning, you will know much more about the censoring body than you will the book being censored because you do not ban that which you don't fear. The most damning response to any book is indifference. Now, if you start consigning works to the flames, you are shooting up a flare and essentially saying, hey, everybody, I'm scared of this book because it threatens me. When the Roman Catholic Church banned Simone de Beauvoir's The Second Sex or the entire oeuvre of Jean-Paul Sartre, do you know anything about those two writers? Or do you know what the Roman Catholic Church fears? When the book burnings took place across Germany in 1933, who did they consign to the flames? Well, you had Heinrich Heine, who said, where they burn books, they will ultimately burn human beings too. He wrote that about a century previous to the burnings. How prophetic. That quote was in context of the Spanish Inquisition and burnings of the Koran. How prophetic a Jewish writer would be consigned to the flames in Nazi Germany about a century or so later. Who else was consigned to the flames? Sigmund Freud. Yeah, there was Albert Einstein, there was Thomas Mann. And then we have this idea, which I always think about. You've got a great tract from John Milton called Areopagitica that was about licensing when it came to publishing, written at the height of the English Civil War and the explosion of literature, anonymous literature, the pamphlet revolution. Suddenly, everybody, or everyone who was half literate, could fling out their political and religious opinions. And so, of course, the government wants to clamp down on that, don't they? And Milton makes some really compelling arguments. There's one argument that I always think about, and this idea is first attributed to Juvenal, the Roman poet. Who will guard the guards themselves? Or, in the context of censorship, who will watch the watchers? Yeah, with the obscenity trial of James Joyce's Ulysses, the first most significant trial was with the Little Review, which Ulysses was published uh, in, in serial form. Their argument, the argument of the, of the defense, was that essentially the book was unintelligible and therefore couldn't corrupt, right? Because that's what they were concerned about, that it would corrupt, yeah? It would make you a sexual deviant if you were to read some of these passages. The second most significant trial, which was the Random House trial, the argument was that Ulysses cannot be obscene because it's a modern classic. The problem with that, and they won the trial, fantastic, they had a great judge who was a very sensitive man who knew his literature and he legalised it because people were smuggling Ulysses in, in and out of countries. You could turn up at a port and they would search your things, the customs officers, they would search your things for copies of Ulysses. Two famous smugglers were Ernest Hemingway and George Orwell, which makes me smile. Um, but they legalised it. But don't we just end up back at the same position, yeah? Because then we might ask, well, who defines a modern classic? 
Yeah, who defines a modern classic? Who defines what is obscene? And also, when the topic of censorship arises, there are certain books that are thrown up as examples. Mein Kampf by Adolf Hitler is an example, isn't it? And I will always remember a friend of mine who read through Mein Kampf very deeply, and he said that he was essentially everything that Hitler would have despised. Yeah, gay, black, a practitioner of Judaism, he knew his Judaism, and he was practicing, though I don't believe he was born into the Jewish community, but he read it all the way through, and he said that he developed such a deep understanding of that epoch and the rationale, the rationale for evil. And sometimes we push things away because we do not want to understand them, and it's a lot easier, but that's also a lot more dangerous, because not understanding very often leads to perpetuating that which came before, yeah? Stephen Dedalus in, in Ulysses said that history is a nightmare from which he's trying to awake. Don't we know it? Don't we see that history essentially continuously recurs? The details change, but it, it essentially keeps going round and round and round, and we don't learn our lessons. But he read through it, and he said that the most damning thing that he could say about the book, of course the ideology was garbage, but he said that it was, above all, poorly written. Very, very poorly written. And one thinks that the Hitler who was an art school reject might have been <laughs> more wounded by that assertion. Yeah, a failed artist. There are, I think, was it Stephen Pressfield who said that it was easier for Hitler to start the Second World War than it was to become an artist? He saw him as a sort of frustrated artist. Um, so that's a common example. And then there are plenty of examples where you ban a book or you take it off the, the school syllabus, for example, because a lot of censorship today, uh, the conversation is happening in the schools. What can you teach? What can't you teach? What's allowed on the syllabus and why? Very often, you take a book off the syllabus and you are giving teenagers the incentive to go read it. I know I would have. If someone told me you can't read that book, it's too naughty. You can't read that book, it's dangerous. You better believe I would have gone and found that book, and teenagers do. So by making it taboo, you also make it rather alluring. So, it's a difficult conversation because on the other hand, we might wonder, does free speech mean being able to say absolutely everything to absolutely everybody? The conversation's a bit different depending on where you are, whether you're in the US or the UK, because in the UK we have hate speech laws. And laws can be manipulated and they can be exploited but we also might wonder, well, what would be the result if such laws or similar laws weren't in place? It's a very nuanced discussion. And ultimately, I am anti-censorship, but I also acknowledge that it's a very nuanced discussion. And I don't know if there is a definitive answer. If there is a definitive answer, it would need to be very open. Very open to different ideas coming from both sides, essentially. What a tremendous question, so thank you very much for that great question. Was there such an important book that made you realise that you wanted to pursue literature in university? It wasn't a book, it was a person, or rather a string of people. Firstly, there was my sixth form English teacher, who was such an inspiration. Yeah, he's really, he really was responsible for fueling my love of Shakespeare, my love of Dickens, my love of literature generally. I don't know if I would have gone to university if it weren't for him. But before him, I had a religious studies teacher who first told me to go to university because when I was younger, I didn't think I was going to go to university. And she thought that would be a shame. And she told me that I need to do two things in my life. Go to Oxford University and then help people. Spend your life helping people. And that has always stuck with me. And I checked off the first one. <laughs> and I have thoughts on that experience. And I am trying my best to check off the second in the ways that I think I can best help people. Of course, there were other influential people in my life. There were many teachers. I was very, very lucky to have many great English teachers at different ages. And then there was my father as well, who took me to the theatre and stoked my love of literature when I was young. And of course, there was my grandmother. And she was the first person to get me into Shakespeare and get me into poetry. And I miss her because I think we, today, if she were around, we could talk about James Joyce and we could talk about Shakespeare. Um, but she was very much responsible for, for the direction I went in. 
So it wasn't really a book, and uh, it, it, was a, it was a set of people. And ultimately, literature is about people, isn't it? And that's why we go to literature, because we want to communicate with people, or understand people, or connect with people on a level that's a bit more, a bit more deep than we are afforded to in our day-to-day -day lives very often. And which was the most emotionally impactful book you have read? Thank you so much for your content. Well, thank you so much for, for watching. The most emotionally impactful book. Oof, there are quite a few. You know, honestly, probably Don Quixote. Probably Don Quixote. Now, when we talk about Cervantes' masterpiece, we often find ourselves asking whether the knight errant is mad or is he just playing at knight errantry? And of course he's playing. But there are parts of that, that book that are tragic. And we, we use the word quixotic, almost, almost in a denigrating way. But as someone who's intensely idealistic myself, I, I really couldn't help but sympathise with elements of Cervantes breaking through uh, in that narrative. I thought that was really emotionally impactful. And, and I found aspects of that book, hilarious though it is, because it is hilarious, I also found a lot of it um, rather difficult rather emotionally difficult. Um, but I'll have a think about that one because there, there are definitely a few books that have been emotionally uh, impactful. Okay, our next question comes from Olga who writes, do you feel sometimes that certain books come into our life at the moments when we need them? And our perception of the book most of the time depends on the emotional state we were in. Does it mean that the reader is never really objective enough to understand the book for what it is. What a fabulous question, that's really nuanced. The thing about rereading that I really love is the fact that if the book is truly great, and if enough time has passed, and if I have genuinely changed or matured, if I have experienced an emotional, a spiritual change, whatever it might be, an intellectual growth, in the years since last reading that book, that book becomes a different book. And it's marvellous to reread a book and to say, oh, I've read that book. Oh, I read Ulysses five years ago, ten years ago. Oh, I read Hamlet in, in high school. No, <laughs> you need to read it again. Macbeth is one example. How can you understand Macbeth as a teenager? We teach children, Romeo and Juliet, Macbeth, Hamlet, whatever it might be, King Lear, but you, you do need that initial period in which you encounter a text and don't quite fully appreciate its power, because when you return to it, you mark the growth and you say to yourself, hey, 10 years on, now I really get it. There are themes in King Lear that you will not understand until you, in your day-to-day -day life, deal with an aging parent, for example, or if you deal with splitting up your own kingdom. There are aspects in Hamlet that you won't get, really, until you've experienced a deep amount of grief. Heaven knows that Shakespeare was experiencing a deep amount of grief when he wrote it. He'd lost his son, and he'd lost his father, and that is everywhere. Ulysses is another example. I say Ulysses because there's a lot of Hamlet in Ulysses, overtly. Ulysses, everybody likes to point out the illusions, which are fun, yeah? And we like to talk about the structure, the Homeric parallels, all that sort of thing. And after that layer of its interpretation, we get into the jokes. But what runs below the surface of jokes? Pain. You can't really have a truthful joke that's funny without trauma and tragedy. Because tragedy leads to insight, yeah? Suffering creates meaning and it stays with us, doesn't it? So, when you have something that's funny, very often it's because it is relatable to something that's painful. And Ulysses is very funny because there's a lot of pain there. I don't see a lot of people talking about this. There's a river of pain running through Ulysses. And that's something that we're going to talk about in the Ulysses lecture series because that's, it can be a really emotionally affecting book. But Olga, what you're talking about is serendipity, yeah? Books coming into our life at a certain time, almost like they were made for us, like they're springing out deliberately, like the universe has said, hey, you're dealing with this right now, read this. And I like to be kind of prescriptive with my reading recommendations, but one part of that 
prescriptive attitude is leaving space for serendipity. Leave space for coincidence. Leave a little bit of room because one day a friend will say to you, hey, I'm reading this book and loving it. And you should be able to go follow that book up, yeah? Or leave a little bit of space so when you walk into a bookstore, you walk in with this attitude like, I just wanna find something that is not on my list. Yeah, I wanna see what leaps out at me. And those are the really special books very often. Some of the most special works of literature have been born out of serendipity. And I talk about this quite a lot. Um, the examples are, are rather endless. And I definitely believe that. I definitely believe that. And very often our lives are ordered in a pattern that is beyond our initial understanding. So when we talk about allusions, right? References to other pieces of literature or in-house references. Yeah, when a, when a word is used in a text and then it's used a few pages later in a different way and then again and again. Yeah, repetition in poetry. Repetition's always significant. The first time we encounter the word that is to be repeated, it might not have much meaning scaffolded onto it, but it accrues meaning over time. And that's like life. Life is composed of broken bits of pottery that are our experiences, the events that happen and the people we meet and we glue them together over time and books help us do that. And so returning to books helps us assimilate everything that we've learned. And I definitely believe that one part of the pattern involves the books that leap out to us at certain moments in time. And I also believe that you believe this because this is the kind of question that one wouldn't ask unless you have already had personal experience with it. And I won't give a huge list of the books that have meant the most to me and the events they correspond to, but so many of the books that I talk about on a daily basis and reread are books that helped me in a very specific way when I most needed it. And so I'm very thankful to these great writers. They, they really do a tremendous service. Yeah, they help us through, don't they? And the next part of your question is interesting. Does it mean that the reader is never really objective enough to understand the book for what it is? So there are different camps on this, yeah? There are some camps that believe that the book holds inherent meaning, and then there are many camps that, the, that believe that once the book is put together, the author throws it out into the world, it's their offering to the life force, so to speak, to quote Ernest Becker. They throw it out, it's a gift to the universe, and it's no longer them, yeah? It's almost like a child, right? It's part of them for a very long time, and then it's out in the world, independent. And readers bring their interpretations to the text. They bring their own lives to the text. And the best works are reflective. And they mean different things. Moby Dick is a perfect example. That book means different things to different people. Because it's about a journey, it's about a hunt, it's about a quest. It's circular, but we're always going on our own little hero's journey, aren't we? So it's going to mean different things to different people at different moments in your life. So that's why Moby Dick, for example, is a great book to read every five, 10 years, and it will always be a little bit different. Is there objective meaning when it comes to art? Sometimes there is, sometimes there is. Now, a lot of people might say, no, it's, it's endlessly subjective. It's definitely more subjective than objective. But why do authors not clarify what they're talking about? Why do they use obscure terminology and references? They don't wanna clarify themselves. Firstly, they might not be able to, yeah, because they're working from a part of them that's more unconscious, so they can't. So the artist and the critic, they're two different things. So maybe they can't. But for those who can, because some writers definitely do understand what they're doing, they will very frequently refuse to interpret it. Yeah? Uh, a few book club members have made the comparison with um, songwriters. Yeah? Musicians are first and foremost fans of music, and they don't want to offer up their definitive analysis to the text, because that would probably hinder the listeners who are bringing their own life to the text. But essentially, yes, as, as readers, you can't hope to be objective, because is there an objective truth? We could get really into the weeds with this, and uh, we should probably do a whole video on this, because it's really interesting. Um, great question. Great question, thank you so much, Olga. Are you a dog or cat person? Honestly, I love both dogs and cats. I absolutely adore animals, and we've always had a lot of both growing up. We've always had dogs and cats, and we've had birds. 
in the family. So I'm very comfortable with, with both. Honestly, I'm a little bit more of a dog person and I actually have plans to start a dogs charity in the not too distant future. But I do love cats too. They're very, very different animals. Recently, I read something nice about how dogs teach you loyalty, whereas cats teach you boundaries. And that is so true. If a cat comes and sits on your lap or rubs up against you, it's because they want to. Um, but dogs, I love dogs. I love all dogs. Uh, the next dog that I would like to get is a German Shepherd. Um, I absolutely love the breed. We've had Labradors uh, before and I do love Labradors too, but I really like the temperament of German Shepherds. I would also like to get a cat in the future too. For me, it would have to be a female cat. I've always had male cats and they, they always get into fights. They can be really territorial and aggressive, whereas the female cats are, are a little more friendly. They're a little bit more gentle and so I'd like to get Get a girl cat. Old books or new books? Old books, pretty much every time. I love the smell of them, I love going to secondhand bookstores, I love finding the marginalia of the previous reader. Uh, favourite trope? For me, my favourite trope, it would be split between metaphor and all of its different permutations, different kinds of metaphors, and irony. Learning to read great literature is essentially learning to navigate metaphorical language, and Aristotle taught us that metaphor is the highest form of thought, so it's difficult. But learning to read great literature is also about learning to navigate irony and to understand what is really being said. And if you can understand metaphor and irony, then Shakespeare will not be a problem. So those are two areas to focus on. There are also two areas of literature that yield so much pleasure. So it's really worth focusing on those two tropes. Best first sentence in a book. That's difficult because there are so many good ones. For me, it would have to be the King James version of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. But I also love the opening to Moby Dick. I love those three opening words, call me Ishmael. So direct, so iconic and the whole first paragraph is an absolute treat and it just leads you straight into the narrative. It contains everything you need to comprehend the narrative. But I've been collecting first lines for years. One of my tutors at university implored us to keep a file. Keep a file of beginnings and endings and I'm so glad I started doing that. And indeed my file is stuffed with really resonant beginnings and endings. We've got The Great Gatsby in there, we've got many examples from Charles Dickens. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Of course we've got Jane Austen's opening to Pride and Prejudice. It's a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. Ten books you would take with you to spend the next 50 years on a deserted island? That's a really great question. I've been working on a podcast that basically follows this idea where I list off ten of my favourite books. Um, off the cuff, I would say The Complete Works of Shakespeare, absolutely. Um, Marcel Proust's In Search of Lost Time. What else? Moby Dick, it would have to be, Moby Dick would have to be there. Can I get the complete works of George Eliot in a single volume? Can I get the complete works of Jane Austen in a single volume? If not, then perhaps I'll take Middlemarch. I adore Middlemarch, I think it's a masterpiece. If I had to take one Jane Austen, then it would probably be Pride and Prejudice. We'd have to take a Dickens, but I don't know which one. Probably with Dickens, I would take A Christmas Carol because I read it every single year. And if I was going to be on a desert island for 50 years, I would probably want to continue following that tradition. I definitely take a huge volume of poetry like this one here. It's not perfect. There's a lot of great poets that are left out of that edition, but I'd probably find the best edition, the best anthology of poetry I could get my hands on and I would take an anthology of poetry. How many is that? I'd have to take Don Quixote by Cervantes. It always makes me laugh. I've just started a another reread of Don Quixote, just dipping into my favourite chapters, my favourite episodes to get started, but I'm going to go right back to the beginning and go all the way through once again. Marvellous book. Uh, that's two more books we need to add. I would also take James Joyce's Ulysses. That's a fabulous book. And that leaves us with one more. Probably the essays of Montaigne. Reading his essays, it feels like you're in company 
with another person, a friend who gets you, who kind of is you, and I think if you're on a deserted island you would need that sense of companionship. So I'd take his essays too. Thank you for the great questions. Now we have a question from Zach. What, if any, books written in the past 50 years do you think have the potential to one day be regarded as great literature in the future? Blood Meridian, absolutely. Cormac McCarthy, uh, 1985, that is a masterpiece. I think it's already considered to be a classic or a modern classic, but I think that reputation will only continue. Uh, that will only be all the more cemented as the years pass. What else is good? I think Jonathan Franzen's The Corrections, that's quite a recent book, is great. Um, I need to read it several more times. I'm currently on a reread of it and I'm loving it all over again, but I think that's really good. And Franzen is a, an author who's unfairly criticized. I don't quite get that. Seemingly, nobody likes him. It doesn't matter who is reading that book. And then there's a little sliver somewhere in the middle where some readers find his work to be really funny and uh, masterfully drawn. So we also have Toni Morrison's Song of Solomon, which I'm currently rereading at the moment. Don DeLillo, I really love White Noise, though I'm not sure that's his masterpiece. Don DeLillo's masterpiece is Underworld, really beautiful, brilliant book. Elena Ferrante's Neapolitan Quartet. Now this, I can't comment on this fully just yet, and many people have asked me what I think of Elena Ferrante, and I've had her books recommended to me so many times. I've picked up the first volume, and I am utterly smitten. I think she is a tremendous writer, though we don't know who she is, do we? And I think that's a really interesting thing as well, is the fact that so many readers have evidently been touched by this writer who is anonymous, and efforts have been made to dig up who this writer is, and I'm, I'm not on board with that personally. But if you haven't read The Neapolitan Quartet, I can tell you as someone who's into the first volume at the moment, that's really good, really tender, really beautiful, really moving, um, really intimate, really raw account. Um, so that's certainly a contender too, in my opinion. Who else do we have from the past 50 years? Kazuo Ishiguro, I thought his Never Let Me Go was tremendous. Um, his recent Clara and the Sun, again, I'm preparing a podcast on that one because I think the ideas in that book are really interesting, but I'm not, I'm not too sure about that one. Not too sure about that one. Life of Pi by Jan Martel. Do you remember Life of Pi? I remember reading that book and being blown away by the idea of being a Hindu, a Christian, and a Muslim, all three at once. I thought, yeah, why can't we be all three at once? I thought that was a, tr a tremendous book. Um, Lincoln in the Bardo, I've said this one a few times, but it is definitely worth saying again. George Saunders, definitely an author to, to keep looking out for and to keep reading. Lincoln in the Bardo is great. It holds up. I reread it again recently. Marvellous book. Those are the ones that leap to mind uh, initially. Thanks for the great question, Zach. Next question is from Ned. Do you let the literature speak for itself or does the reputation of an author influence your opinion of a work? Would you read a work by an author who has been deprecated by critics you admire? I'll address that second question first. Would you read a work by an author who critics I admire deprecate? Absolutely. Absolutely. If anything, it is, that's, that's a tip-off to really go deep into that scorned writer. I do not want to take my opinions wholesale from another. I want to make up my own mind. And it's difficult. It is difficult. Because many writers have a reputation that precedes them. When you say Shakespeare, people groan, don't they? Because there's a reputation there. Difficult. Dense. <laughs> Maybe elusive and elusive. Yeah, the reputation is there and it's really, really hard to shake off the shackles of reputation. But that's one thing that we do try to do as readers if we're trying to be open-minded. Read those works that maybe your gut is saying, nah, don't read that, it's not worth it. Maybe you should read those works that don't agree with your worldview. That's the best way to cement your own worldview and make it more robust and continue to grow is to be exposed to ideas that going in you might say, nah. And there are a lot of great works that challenge us in that regard. I'm personally very careful to speak overwhelmingly about the authors and works that move me and that I love. 
Yeah, I, I would much rather influence somebody to go and read a work because I've loved it, and then they're okay to not love it, because you don't have to love everything, that's not the ideal uh, reaction to a piece of art. If it moves you, if it provokes you, if it changes your mind on something, if it gives you a visceral response, then that's good. Obviously, it would be great if you loved the literature too, but I'm, I'm, I would be very careful to damn any, any literature, and I'm also very open to the fact that my opinions are very fluid. There are so many great writers who I didn't like for a very long time, and I changed my mind as I grew. So I'm, I'm careful about that. But yeah, absolutely, read, read those works. Um, whether a critic likes them or not, check them out anyway and see if you agree with the critic or not. And the first part of your question, Ned, do you let the literature speak for itself or does the reputation influence? The reputation is always kind of going to influence you, isn't it? But I do my utmost to let the literature speak for itself. And something I don't do, if I'm coming to a work for the first time, is I don't read the introduction. Now, a lot of people have reached out to me and said, oh, I read an introduction and it ruined the book. Yeah, it ruins it because firstly, there's often spoilers. <laughs> and secondly, um, you're getting an opinion that's formed by someone who's probably studied that book for decades. They're an expert on that book. And if you're coming to the book for the first time, you have unique insights. Perhaps you don't want to be conditioned to merely see what the expert has pointed out because you have the newcomer's insights. Yeah, the, seeing the work with fresh eyes is very, very valuable. Okay, we have a question from Zoe. Massive congratulations on hitting this epic milestone. Thank you so much and uh, thank you very much for being here. What book do you find yourself rereading time and again? Uh, I don't want to give the, the obvious answer, which is the works of Shakespeare, because I read Shakespeare pretty much every day. Um, let's say the essays of Montaigne and the essays of Emerson. I read those, those two very, very frequently. Okay, are there any books you've changed your mind about? Better on a second read, not as good as you remembered. Thank you for all your videos, book clubs, podcasts, etc. It's always a pleasure hearing your thoughts. Ah, oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. The really obvious example that comes to mind is Jane Austen. So, like many uh, students in the UK, I had to study Jane Austen for school, for English. I had to study Pride and Prejudice. And I, I thought maybe there was something wrong with me because the whole class loved it, loved that book. And I despised it. And I read it 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 so many times. And I returned to it over the years and I simply couldn't abide it. And then, a few years down the line, persuasion, yeah, unlocked Jane Austen for me. A quiet, autumnal masterpiece. She wrote that very near to the end. It's very subtle and it's beautiful. And that unlocked the power of Jane Austen to me. And what I found was when I returned to Pride and Prejudice, um, by the way, there, there are books that are a little bit exempt because I remember really enjoying Northanger Abbey right from the get-go. But when I returned to Pride and Prejudice, I had the insights from Persuasion, and I'd also lived a little bit more, and I'd read a lot more Shakespeare, which really helps with Pride and Prejudice if you don't take to it immediately. And the comedy was lively, it was sparkling, and I knew all the characters, yeah? Not by reputation, but because I'd met them in my actual life. And I fell in love with that book, and I laughed pretty much every single page. I teared up. I thought it was tremendous. I had a real strong positive gut reaction to Pride and Prejudice, uh, very similar to how I responded to Don Quixote, and I fell in love with Jane Austen. And she is brilliant, and I, I don't go too long without reading her today. So that's the obvious example for me. So when somebody says they don't like a particular classic, and everybody has their examples, yeah? It might not be Jane Austen, it might be James Joyce. That's a common one. Lots of people want to read Ulysses, but they also feel like, Maybe he's taken the mick out of them, but it's not great. Um, that takes time as well. And you can change your mind on that. Shakespeare's a big one. A lot of people don't like Shakespeare at school. School does a, an awful job at teaching Shakespeare. Um, but coming later in life to Shakespeare, yeah, once you've gone through some things, is quite the experience. Uh, so those are some obvious ones. So I, I definitely would say keep persevering with the great books. If you do not like a particular work that is considered great, that's okay. It's reflective of who you are right now. Give it a couple of years, give it five years, give it 10 years, you might feel differently. Moby Dick, that's another one. That's another one where 
people change their mind after they've been through some things, you know? Thank you very much for the awesome question. Gabriella asks, is there one particular book that made you fall in love with reading? If so, what is it? Yeah, I, well, very similar to uh, my answer to a question earlier in the show was it wasn't a, a specific book, but rather a specific person or several people. If I had to pinpoint one book though, it would probably be the complete works of Shakespeare. I have a very strong uh, memory of checking out from my public library a fat copy of the complete works of Shakespeare. It was dirty, it, you know, it had been sitting on the shelf for a while. It's because my grandmother had spoken about As You Like It and Rosalind, and she'd spoken about going to the theatre as a little girl in Dublin, and I wanted to impress her, so I checked it out. I was very young. Um, I also checked out some Dickens, and I read Romeo and Juliet and I read As You Like It. And although I didn't understand it, it hit me. It kind of, there was something there that I found mesmerizing. It was a magical experience. Um, so probably the complete works of Shakespeare. Okay, next question. I thank you very much for all that you do for us in the world of literature. Ah, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Second, George Eliot. Everyone talks Middlemarch, but never her other novels. Do you like her other novels? Third, do you prefer Oxford World Classic or Penguin Classic? Fourth, be well, sir. Well, be well to you too. Thank you so much. I love George Eliot. I think she's absolutely tremendous. Everyone talks Middlemarch because it is her masterpiece. But another author, if another author had put out her oeuvre without Middlemarch, that, that author would be really, really respected today and those books would be read more often. Middlemarch overshadows some of her other works. They're all great. Some of them indeed are better than others. My second favorite after Middlemarch is The Mill on the Floss. I, I adore this um, novel and if you haven't read it, I highly recommend it, but she's got loads, loads of works, not she hasn't got a huge oeuvre, but she's definitely got enough to be getting on with. You've got Daniel Deronda, uh, you've got Felix Holt, The Radical, Adam Bede, and a few more. Her selected essays are also worth picking up too. I've been drawn to George Eliot for the longest time. She seems to me to be like a pastoral writer, yeah? Someone who obviously prefigures Thomas Hardy, and if you love reading the novels of Thomas Hardy and you want an extension of that, if you like living in the world of Wessex, then of course you need to read his influence. So if you like that sort of thing, you'll love George Eliot, and yet, despite the fact that she's capable of these really beautiful passages, this really picturesque prose, she's quite an epic writer, and so it's no surprise to discover that she was writing an epic before Middlemarch, and she's quite poetic. I also think she's very funny. A lot of critics don't see the humour in her, but I find her very funny. But what's interesting is it's almost like a pastoral writer who's also a scientist. She's very precise, and she's very cognitively demanding, and she uses her works as essays. Middlemarch, definitely. And I love that precision. I really, really adore that precision, and it's almost like she exists between two worlds. I find her endlessly relatable, and I think she's one of the few writers who does a good service to both male and female characters. So yes, George Eliot, absolutely. Everybody should read her, she's fabulous. And the question of Oxford world classics or Penguin is really difficult. I'm leaning towards Oxford world's classics. The annotations are really good. They usually have a really good uh, intro, and they have good um, material that teaches you a little bit more about the book and the pictures are gorgeous but they're both great and uh, I have tons of books from both houses. Thank you for the great question. Martine asks, what was the main reason behind creating your own book club? And on average, how long does it take for you to make your content? And did you ever have to surmount obstacles or difficulties in putting yourself out there on social media? Those are really nice questions. Thank you, Martine. On average, how long does it take? It takes quite a while, and I won't sugarcoat it. The, the podcasts, the videos, the talks, they all take a ton of prep, a ton of research. We had a question in the book club recently on the latest episode of Coffee. The Q&A show that comes out every month, we sit down with a cup of coffee and we discuss books and we go quite deep on some really difficult topics, but we went quite deep on how I put 
my content together and I'm actually going to have a video that will come out relatively soon that gives you a peek behind the scenes, shows you my process. I know that there are a lot of teachers and lecturers and professors who watch these videos, which is awesome, so I thought it would be a fun conversation. Essentially, yeah, it, I put a lot of work into it and a lot of planning goes into it, but a lot of love goes into it too, so I do enjoy it. As for why I created my own book club, I think I've spoken about this on the last um, Q&A show, but essentially the Hardcore Literature Book Club was created during lockdown in England, and we saw readers either returning to the classics or going to the classics in a big way for the first time over the course of lockdown. Sales of classic literature were at an all-time high during lockdown. Many of the works we discuss are notoriously difficult, so they require a little bit of mediation and a guide, some historical understanding, some aesthetic appreciation, and I think appreciating these great works together is so much more rewarding than doing it in isolation. I love reading in isolation, it's really rewarding too, but sharing what we have found and what we know, that is, that is such a joy, it's my favourite thing to do. But many of the books that we discuss are difficult. They're also the books that people want to have read before they die. And during lockdown, I had a lot of people telling me that they had grown tired of the more frivolous and dispensable forms of entertainment. And a lot of people had watched everything that there was to watch. Yeah, and they were getting bored and they wanted a challenge and they wanted to experience some growth. And so there was a need on a global level, a longing for resonance and meaning and that is always going to lead you to great literature. And so I had a lot of people asking me to put a book club together. And if you have enough people asking you to do something, eventually think, okay, I'm going to do it. And it went down really well. We have a great little group. Uh, the discussions are always incredibly insightful and it's been incredibly rewarding. For me, literature is a, a way of connecting with other people on a very deep level. And those are some of the reasons why we put the club together. And Martine, you have a really interesting question here. Did you ever have to surmount obstacles or difficulties in putting yourself out there on social media? Yeah, I mean, there are definitely obstacles when it comes to putting oneself out there on social media. I'm very lucky that the response has been really positive. I'm a strong believer in putting out what you want to get back. And so if you put out love, if you put out positive vibes, if you put out kindness, you'll get that back. And I do know that it can be really difficult for a lot of people. And I don't envy a lot of people who put themselves out there on social media because some people do get a load of crap, quite honestly. Uh, some people can be a little bit divisive, some people can be controversial. And the internet is a place that's it's largely anonymous, isn't it? So of course, you're, if you're dealing with people at scale and you're dealing with anonymity and you're dealing with impulsivity, then you might get some negative stuff as well. Luckily, everyone's been really awesome here and it's absolutely blown my mind that we have such a lovely little community. When I first started putting videos together, I wasn't sure if people wanted this kind of discussion. Did people want to talk about Shakespeare, George Eliot? Do people want to talk about these books? And I found out fairly swiftly um, that people really did and people really took to it. And so I'm just grateful every day, to be honest, and uh, it's been a great experience. So luckily there haven't really been obstacles and uh, it's been wonderful. So thank you for the great question. Okay, the next question's from Martin. Did a book ever make you cry? A couple made me cry because they were so relevant to my life and they were also beautiful works of art. Well, now I'm really curious. You have to tell me which ones they were for you, Martin. Um, Don Quixote made me cry. Uh, I found Les Miserables to be quite a tearjerker at certain points. There are moments in Joyce's Ulysses that have made me pause and feel a little bit like I needed to catch my breath. I'll tell you a poet who always makes me cry, and it's Wilfred Owen. I cannot read the poetry of Wilfred Owen without tearing up. I just feel the injustice of it all, the pointlessness of bloodshed and war. War, man, is, is one of the things that without fail can really affect me, really upset me. There's not a whole lot, yeah? Animal cruelty, yes. Um, Death generally, yes, but war, I, I don't know, I, I read about different accounts of, of, of war. And when you read poetry, that's the account of the human soul under duress 
And I read it and I think about how Wilfred Owen didn't make it out. Yeah, he got really close and he died. And so many great poets, writers died. And the thing that upsets me the most is this idea that these writers would come back from the war. They'd come back from the Battle of the Somme, like J.R.R. R. Tolkien. He was at the Somme. So many were at the Somme. One of the worst battles of all time. So much loss. And he came back and he never spoke about it. That's what everybody says. Not just writers, anyone who went there, they come back, they didn't speak about it. Can you imagine how bad it would have to be for you to not speak, to not be able to speak about it? But he did speak about it because we have his, his books, don't we? We have The Lord of the Rings and I think he sublimated a lot into that. A lot of people say, well, it's not just about, it's not about the war, it's not an analogy for this, um, it's not a biblical analogy. There's a lot of everything in there. And who you are comes out in your writing. And so I think he did speak about it, and I think it was awful. Uh, so yeah, the war poets, they, they get me. They get me. Eric asks, thoughts on genre? I'm in love with reading detective stories, but not mysteries. And I have a waning 25-year obsession with sci-fi from the later half of the 20th century. I love genre fiction. I always read it. At the moment, I have recently returned to Isaac Asimov's Foundation uh, series. Wonderful works. I read them when I was very little, uh, when I was a child. So returning to them has, has been a real, real treat. And I've also recently got my hands on a two-volume uh, Library of America set of noir fiction, American crime fiction, I believe through to the 40s or 50s, but there's some really great novels in there too, and it's, oh, it's great fun, great fun. I'm a huge fan of genre. I'm a huge fan of uh, gothic, yeah? Gothic as a genre has always been denigrated. It used to be that if you said you like to read novels, everyone would assume you're, you're not reading highbrow literature, but you're enjoying romances and gothic tales. Uh, but I love those stories. I, I think they're such a fascinating insight into who we are. And they're just great escapism. And we can talk endlessly about the value of literature and live in the great books, which I love to do. We can talk about the philosophical resonance of these works. But great literature is supposed to be escapist too. Not always, but very often it's meant to be a treat and a retreat from your life. And uh, yeah, some of the genre... The, the, the works of genre fiction, detective stories, some, uh, some of the sci-fi. Oh, it's wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. William says, congrats on the milestone. Very well deserved. Your channel's a true gem for me. Thank you, William. I appreciate that. Is there a book, one that is considered great literature, that you've started but not finished? Why did you put it down and do you plan to go back to it? I've been reading Eiji Yoshikawa's Musashi for years. And I don't know, if, is that considered great literature? Is it considered a classic? Over in Japan, it most certainly is one of the best-selling books, if not the best-selling book of all time. Someone will have to check that. Either way, everybody knows the story of Musashi. I have been reading that for years and deliberately going really, really slow. I don't want the story to end. I do know how it goes. I've read some manga uh, adaptations of the story. I know the story, but I just, I don't want it to end. It's a big book, but I've been taking my time with it. And there are a few books that are like that. As for works that are considered great, but maybe I've put them down because I, I didn't like them or couldn't get into them. Personally, nothing immediately comes to mind on that front. If I haven't finished a book, it's typically deliberate. Um, William also asks, what bits of advice would you give a teenage version of yourself regarding reading and writing? Thanks again for all you do. Oh, thank you very much. Advice to my teenage self. Firstly, I would say read as much as possible. Now, my teenage self was already reading a lot. I would listen to Bob Dylan records uh, late into the night and I'd read Arthur Rimbaud, I'd read Charles Baudelaire, uh, Walt Whitman, I would read philosophy, Schopenhauer, that sort of thing. What advice would I give though? I would, I would definitely say read more. What you're already doing, just keep doing more of it. Just read and read and read and stuff your head with that information. A lot won't make sense at a young age. You can still appreciate it, yeah? Lots of teenagers ask me, should I read Proust? 
Well, I read Proust when I was, I think I was like 13 or 14, maybe 14, on work experience. I was working at a, a publisher's office and I used to go on my lunch break around the corner to a bookstore and one of those lunch times I picked up the first volume of In Search of Lost Time. And I didn't finish it, I didn't get it, I didn't get the resonance, but I'm glad that I picked it up at that young age. And just stuff your head with as much great literature, as many great ideas as you can, because they will mould you, they will form you, yeah? They will make you who you are, and you will recall them later when you're older and you have the lived experience. So that's really important. Read as much as possible, write. Yeah, I, I didn't need any prompting to write. I kept a journal when I wrote poetry and stories and all sorts of different things, reviews. I was writing all the time, but write, yeah? Scribble in your books, write. Talk about your books. This is a difficult one because when I was a teenager, nobody really wanted to talk about literature or couldn't. I went to a state school. It wasn't a great state school. If you were seen reading Shakespeare, people would kind of poke fun at you a little bit. There was a little bit of respect there though. And I think a lot of, people who maybe didn't take to literature thought that maybe there was something they were missing and that they didn't know how to get into that literature because I've since found that the best people to talk to about literature aren't academics, yeah, but just people who have normal jobs, yeah? And the, the most interesting insights come from people who, as I said, they're not academics, they just pick up a book and they've got that lived experience and they've got a profession that's separate from the study of literature. And that's what's really exciting to me. So I love talking to people, all kinds of people from all over the world about these great books. And I find that people really, really do, um, really do uh, come into their own when it comes to talking about these great works. As a teenager, I would try to talk to people about the books I was reading. And I, I have a very strong memory of that being the point where I fractured off from my current friendship group. I was reading Kemu, the myth of Sisyphus. I was reading that sort of thing. And I wanted to talk to people about it, but suddenly people weren't as receptive. And I found that it was, it was really, really difficult. So obviously going to university was good in that regard because I could finally talk to people about these ideas. Luckily today, the internet is really quite a powerful tool and we have online locations like the Hardcore Literature Book Club where that discussion is available to you. You can contribute, you can see what other people are saying, you can talk to me, and I think that's a really valuable, powerful thing to do. So try to get into dialogue with people about what you're reading, that's really good. So read, write, discuss, those would be the, the, main, the main three right there. It's worth keeping in mind as well, when you're young, you have a lot of energy, and you won't appreciate this until you get a little bit older, but you have a lot of energy and that's the main thing that that's going for you. So use that energy and we're talking about output. So just write a lot, yeah? Forget about quality and all that sort of thing. You can focus on that, you can do different writing exercises, but just get a ton out there. And the same with reading, just get a ton inside you. I know that probably sounds like a contradiction because I'm a fan of slow reading, rereading, that sort of thing. I'm not saying don't do that either, definitely do that too, but yeah, read as voraciously as possible and read what interests you, uh, read different ideas, and uh, that's probably the best advice that I, can, that I can give. Okay, Lila says, congratulations on 20K, thank you very much. Very nerdy question, but I was wondering what you think of Finnegan's Wake by James Joyce, and if you had any tips for reading it. Tips for reading it. So I do have some future content that's currently in the planning stage because I would really love to do something special with Finnegan's Wake because it's probably held up as the most impenetrable book. It's the one that has the, the reputation as being the most difficult, doesn't it? Everyone, everyone puts that book down. Yeah, even the great writers who got in early on appreciating Ulysses couldn't abide Finnegan's Wake. T.S. Eliot told Virginia Woolf to read Ulysses again. She said it was the work of a queasy undergraduate squeezing his spots and T.S. Eliot said no. James Joyce is onto something here, read it again. Ezra Pound saw that Joyce was onto something and he pushed it through, yeah, he pushed it through, he backed it. Pound put down Finnegan's Wake. I, seemingly no one could abide Finnegan's Wake and with good reason, if you pick it up, read a random page and you'll see exactly why. It's staring you right in the face, it's deliberately dense and difficult. And James Joyce famously said it took him 17 years to write it, so he would like the reader to take 17 years to read it. And so people think he was taking the mick out of the reader. He wasn't. He was writing for someone who's like him. 
yeah, a little bit nerdy, a little bit geeky, somebody who wants to get into the weeds with literature and constantly reread over the course of their life. That's what he wanted. He wanted to keep academics busy too, which I think is a bit of a defiant middle finger. But to answer briefly at this point, what I would say is that there are two people who are really, really good at discussing Finnegan's Wake, and they have been indispensable for my own understanding of that book. And they are Joseph Campbell, who has a skeleton key. He tells you what the book's all about, and he leads you through it. Great book, indispensable. And also Anthony Burgess, yeah, the writer of A Clockwork Orange, the writer of Nothing Like the Sun. He has a video, which I believe is on YouTube, it's about 17 or 20 minutes long, where he performs it a little bit, he reads it aloud, he appreciates it, we listen to some music, he has a Guinness in a pub, and that's fabulous too. Those two, Joseph Campbell, Anthony Burgess, are indispensable when it comes to Finnegan's Wake. The next thing I would suggest is get yourself an audio version, because what you'll discover is that Finnegan's Wake makes a lot more sense when you hear it and when you say it. It really does. It's incomprehensible, almost, on the page. Another thing to understand is that reading groups with Finnegan's Wake typically take years to get through that book, and they actually don't really get through it. They do a page at a time, not even a page, sometimes like a sentence here and there, and they take their time, and they just throw things out there. They throw ideas out there and they say, this sentence reminds me of this, this sentence reminds me of that. And in the book club, we spoke about Finnegan's Wake very briefly, and I read out a passage, and I pointed out the allusion, the oral allusion, to the Lord's Prayer, yeah? And a book club reader pointed out the Quranic allusion. And of course, if you go down this rabbit hole, you'll find that Joyce had a copy of the Quran in French, he had many books on Islam and was fascinated by it. So in the same little compressed space, we have allusions to the Quran, we have Christian allusions, and many more. And they unfold over time, yeah? They unfold, meaning unfolds. For a meaning to unfold, it first needs to be folded up, and then we need to unfold it, and that takes time. It takes multiple people discussing it, it takes a lot of reading and thinking, it takes an encyclopedia, a dictionary, and it requires a lot of patience, and it requires one to not take themselves too seriously. Don't take it too seriously, because I used to get frustrated with it too, yeah? Uh, and now I really enjoy it, but it's definitely an ongoing project for me too, and one that I'm really excited to keep going uh, through. Okay, we have a question from Tiffany who says, I am applying to Cambridge this year for English literature. These days, I'm often feeling very under the weather about applying since my mind goes blank when trying to write my personal statement. Could you please give me some encouragement or some general life advice on this phase in my life? Yes, I can. And thank you for your kind words, Tiffany. I really appreciate them. You're at a very significant growth period in your life. And the world is also in an incredible growth period or period of change. The world is changing very, very quickly. And one of the greatest resources we have is flexibility and adaptability and being open to new ideas, open to new experiences. If we can be flexible and adaptable, we'll be all right. And this is a period in your life where you've said you, you don't feel too great. And I do sympathize with that because when I was younger, I went through like depressive cycles, I'd feel very blue. And I'm still prone to that, yeah? And I'm not sure if that's a temperament thing, or it's probably a temperament thing. If you're into the Myers-Briggs, I'm an INFJ. I used to go through these, these sort of cycles of feeling quite low, but as I got older, I could almost anticipate them. And when you're in them, you might think they're gonna last forever. And the younger you are, the longer everything seems to take. Yeah, that's what's really strange about temporality. As you get older, time goes really, really quickly, really quickly. But when you're younger, some things can feel like they're lasting a lifetime. And obviously it doesn't always help to tell yourself, in a couple of weeks I'm gonna feel good and my, and my mood's going to lift. That doesn't help when you're in it, but an acknowledgement of that is still rather important. Having said that, do things consciously to look after yourself and promote your well-being, your mental well-being. You need to look after yourself as though you were a friend to yourself. And many of us don't talk to ourselves very nicely. Yeah, we, we make a mistake and we say, ah, oh, you're an idiot. Oh, you're always doing this. 
You'll never do anything right. Maybe we don't quite realise we're saying that because we're, we're not tuned in to our thoughts or we're too inextricably bound up with our thoughts and we identify ourselves with our minds. This is what's interesting about James Joyce because if you read Ulysses, you start to follow your, your own broken, fragmented train of thoughts and you see that many of the thoughts that come to you aren't really yours. They're kind of like alien creatures. And if you examine your thoughts, you might find, okay, this one came from my parents, this one came from my school, this one came from society and what, what the media is telling me, this one came from this experience. And we have these long running monologues in our head and we sometimes have not thought through the things that have negatively impacted us properly, but they continue to affect us. What I'm saying is don't beat yourself up and look after yourself because it all trickles down from you. And at this age, if you're anything like me, you want to save the world, yeah? But you need to start at home. And that's the fabulous thing about George Eliot's Middlemarch. That book is about reform, yeah? But reform starts at home. And there's a moment in that book where one of the characters wants to push a pro-change ad agenda, pro-reform. But the neighbors essentially say, how can you do that if you are a bad landlord? Yeah, how can you talk about changing the world if you haven't already got your affairs in order? And when you're young, it's all about using your energy and getting your affairs in order so you can be a boon upon the world later and so you can help people. And some people will tell you that you're being selfish, but you need to be selfish in order to be selfless and you need to look after yourself. And you need to put yourself first. It's very much like what they tell you in aeroplanes about securing your face mask first. Why? It's not selfish. It's so you can be an aid to other people. So you need to look after yourself. You need to exercise. You need to get out away from being mired in your work now and then. Downtime aids insight. That's what Cal Newport tells us in Deep Work. Fabulous book. Stretches of productivity and focus. And then go have some downtime. Go for a walk. Do something healthy. Eat healthy. Exercise regularly. Do things that make you feel good. Just look after yourself and keep going, yeah? You probably have a dream, you probably have a goal. Now you might not, you might think, oh, I don't know what I wanna do with my life, that's fine. But if you have a dream and a goal, you're in a, a nurturing period right now, an early period. And life is long, and you have a lot of time to mess up and make the wrong decisions, especially when you're young. You have a lot of time to do over. So don't take anything too seriously, yeah? You'll be afforded ample opportunity to do the best you possibly can in this world and you will find your way but look after yourself that's what i would tell you okay next question i can't express how much i love your videos and how you talk about literature thank you very much my question is which literary characters are the most influential or best in your opinion and why ac bradley in his oxford lectures on shakespeare's tragedies said that there were four inexhaustible personages Hamlet, Cleopatra, Iago, and Falstaff. Inexhaustible means you can't get to the end of them. Now, if you're thinking about Cleopatra, she has infinite variety. That's what we're told. We might think of Whitman's multitudes. I contain multitudes. Do I contradict myself? Very well. Yeah, we, we contradict ourselves because we are human. And Emerson will tell us that consistency is a foolish hobgoblin of little minds, something like that. So those characters who are, are the most influential are the ones that have gifted us the most psychological complexity and taught us about ourselves. And I think A.C. Bradley's four inexhaustible characters are a good place to start, they're all great. Shakespeare has many more characters on top of those four who are nearly inexhaustible. If you read James Joyce's Ulysses, I think Joyce comes pretty close to being a writer who can give us characters as inexhaustible as Shakespeare, yeah, with Leopold Bloom, Stephen Dedalus as well, but definitely Leopold Bloom and Molly Bloom. But I think the, the Shakespearean characters are probably, if I had to choose personally, uh, a set of best characters, it would be those characters because so much of literature after those characters is in response to those characters. Okay, next question. What do you think about setting reading goals? And how do you not make it about just hitting a specific number and having it just as a motivational tool to make you consistent throughout the year? I like drafting up a list of 
a dozen, maybe half a dozen books that I really want to read. Make them really, really good books. These are the books that you could take your time over. And of course, anything you add on top is a bonus. But those are the books that you'll slow read. Now, if you want to read many more books, that's great. Maybe you'll, you'll go faster with other works. Fantastic. But draft up a very small list. Err on the side of a small amount of books. And for me, it's been some time since I've used quantity as a measure of success because I found that it wasn't rewarding. And when I embraced quality, pivoting into slowness, writing around the subject, talking around it, thinking about it, rereading it, uh, that's when I found the most personal growth. So if you find having a quota is motivational, that's great. I'd say embrace it, have a list that you're working through. But definitely don't get hung up on the number or ticking things off. The thing to get hung up on is immersing yourself and getting as much as you can out of the book that's in front of you right now. What is your advice on rereading books, especially the classics? I love rereading, but a lot of people I know think it's a waste of time, which is crazy. Yeah, you'll, you'll get that response. I love rereading. I think it's more important than the initial read. The initial read is important in so much as it leads to the next reading experience. So ignore people who say you're crazy and enjoy your rereads. That's the most important thing, I think, when it comes to great literature. Good evening, Ben. Some people believe that language, culture and science are degraded today compared to the powerful heyday of the 17th to 20th centuries. What is your opinion? My opinion is that in every century, we feel as though the culture is degrading or decaying. If you look to the end of the 19th century, we have Max Nordau's Degeneration, and he thought writers like Friedrich Nietzsche and Oscar Wilde, he thought composers like Richard Wagner, they were evidence for the degradation of the culture. We see it in every century, we have this anxiety that we're decaying, and we often look back to a past that we did not experience with nostalgia. Nostalgia for a time that we weren't in. And we have a tendency to think that the grass is always greener. Things were better back then. In every age, there's a golden age. A golden age, or a heyday, a siglo del oro, that we do not have right now. It's not the age we're currently in. It's the age of the perhaps not too distant past. Having said that, however, Vico would definitely say that we're in a, a period of degeneration, if you like, right now. If you look to the Viconian cycles of history, which is, that's the structure that James Joyce utilised for Finnegan's Wake, you'll see that we move through a theocratic or divine age into an aristocratic age and then into a democratic age, and then there's disorder, chaos, and that chaos will remain until we hear the voice of God and then return full circle to the theocratic age. So history endlessly recurs. It recurs in the individual as well, but it goes round and round and round. And if we're in a period of degeneration and decay, truly, then we might see it as simply prologue to the next, the, the start of the next cycle, beginning at the theocratic age, the divine age. Personally, I, I do really love the literature from the past few hundred years and it definitely does look like we had a bit of a heyday that's been and gone. But at the same time, I realise that it's very difficult to honestly give valuable appraisals of contemporary literature and events because we're simply too close to it. Um, so difficult question there, but good one. Thank you. Okay, next question. Are you a fan of any of the postmodernist writers? I'd love to hear your thoughts on David Foster Wallace, Pynchon and Gaddis in particular. That's William Gaddis. I can't say I've really read much of Gaddis, so I'd really appreciate your recommendations for where to start. Where should I start with Gaddis? Where do you think? Um, as for the other two that you've mentioned, Pynchon is a master, an absolute master, and definitely deserves the credit that he is given. Gravity's Rainbow is a masterpiece. The Crying of Lot 49 is terrific. Um, I really do rate Pynchon quite highly, and we'll be talking about Gravity's Rainbow in the not too distant future. David Foster Wallace. I was a huge fan of David Foster Wallace as a young man, and I've been meaning to return to him in a significant way for a very long time. I'd like to return to Infinite Jest and The Pale King as well, but I'm really excited to see whether that work holds up. I certainly did rave about him when I was a little bit younger. Jonah, 
says, I remember you speaking of Bob Dylan as a poet. Have you ever heard of Nick Drake? Yes, I have. If so, I'd love to hear your thoughts on his melancholy lyricism and the aesthetics, mythography of Pink Moon and Nick's own life as a whole. Yeah, I believe I was speaking of Bob Dylan as a poet because I went to a Geoffrey Hill lecture at Oxford when he was professor of poetry at Oxford University and I remember him banging the table with force. He said that Bob Dylan was a fine musician, something like that, but he was not a poet. And I was thinking, really? Is he not a poet? The Nobel Committee certainly seemed to think that he's a great writer, which obviously resulted in a lot of controversy. As for Nick Drake, I love Nick Drake, always have. When I was a young man, I suffered from insomnia vicious insomnia and the doctors prescribed the same heavy duty tricyclic antidepressant that Nick Drake was on. The antidepressant that killed him. Now from, from what I remember there's a very fine line with that particular medication between overdosing and not. So from what I recall because it's been a while since I've read about Nick Drake and his life there was some speculation as to whether it was suicide or whether it was accidental. I don't know personally on that account, he was obviously very depressed and his music is beautiful. Haunting. Completely haunting. River Man, that, that one in particular is very, very haunting. Pink Moon is beautiful. It's one of my favourite albums of all time. Um, I don't know if I can speak of his mythography as such. It's been a little while since I've properly immersed myself in his music. All I know is he is a tremendous musical and poetic talent. And what a shame that he died so young. He was very young when he died. And that's so often the way with these great writers and poets and musicians. They die too young. And what would we have? What musical gifts would we have in the world if he had not? Um, what a tragedy. When I found out that information, I took myself off of that medication. And over the years, I returned to, to the doctor with complaints of insomnia. And whether I was going private or it was public health care, they would always lean into that prescription and I'd have to look and say, well, I'm, not, I'm not taking that. Um, it wasn't great. It wasn't a great um, medication for me personally. Not saying that others might not get some benefit out of it, but that was my little um, strange tie to, to Nick Drake. But yeah, brilliant musician, 100%. Okay, not a question, but just a really lovely comment. And so many of you have simply left really lovely comments saying congratulations and thank you. And so I'd like to take a moment to say I appreciate all of you. So thank you so much. And this comment reads, I'm going to sacrifice my opportunity to ask a question and devote this comment to thanking you for all your amazing videos you've presented to us. I honestly feel your videos are worth university credits in classic literature and you give them to us for free. Thank you so much. That really does mean... Uh, the world to me. Okay, next question. How to keep oneself motivated to read books consistently amidst work pressures and academics? Any tips? I'm working on a video at the moment uh, that is going to give you some tips on how to focus on literature. And I'm going to start that particular video by asserting that we don't have trouble motivating ourselves to do something that we really need to do. Like if we absolutely need to do it, or it's inextricably bound up with our dreams, something that we really, really want to do, we actually don't always need a ton of motivation. Now, you might be tired. It sounds like you've got a lot on your plate, academics, work, lots of pressure. So you might still want to read, which you clearly do because you're asking for tips, but you're fatigued at the end of the day. You want to pick up that book, but it's a bit easier to just sort of doze off and laze around. I do it too. Come the end of the day, sometimes I'm not still firing on all cylinders. My tip would be to forge a little bit of time, maybe early on in the day when you still have powers of concentration, a little bit of time that's sacred to you. Slot it in like an appointment, the kind of appointment that you will make for someone else, but make an appointment with yourself. A few times a week, yeah, maybe you need to get up early, you're already getting up early enough as it is, but maybe you get up a little bit earlier and you dedicate that time to your self-improvement, your self-growth, reading. And so that's what you do. You take back control and you slot in the time. And then you work on habits, yeah? It's easier to do that which is habitual to us. And if you want to make something habitual, you anchor it to something else you're already doing. So make an evaluation of the micro, what you do on a daily basis, and see if you can scaffold a little bit of reading onto those things that you're already doing. Are there periods where, say, 
you're traveling to and fro someplace where you can listen to something, are there any periods, any gaps in the day that you can take advantage of? And as for motivation, you might also want to look to what you're reading, yeah? Are you reading something because you're feeling like you're supposed to? Or are you reading it because you really want to know what that author is saying? Are you reading it because it's a riveting story? Are you reading it because it's got things to teach you and you're excited to learn them? So make an evaluation of your reading materials as well as how you approach them too. Congratulations on 20k. What is your opinion on George Orwell? I especially love his down and out in Paris and London. I do too. I think that was the first Orwell that I read. George Orwell, um, very prophetic writer, but we know that, don't we? There's a great book called Amusing Ourselves to Death, and the writer is Neil Postman, and he contested that we're not living in an Orwellian future, but we're actually living in a Huxleyan future, which is a really interesting conversation to get into. George Orwell's fantastic. Read Animal Farm, and if you can navigate that book, you have successfully learnt to read Analogy. He's a visionary writer, he's a deeply metaphorical writer, and his dystopian vision of the future, we might say, is pretty much already here. Orwell in particular is an interesting writer because he is so rooted in the culture. We say something is Orwellian, don't we? And yet he is thoroughly overlooked. So we all know about his books, and yet we do not heed his call, and I do wonder how many people are really reading what he wrote. Fabulous writer though, he's got many great works, his essays are really worth reading too. Patricia asks, do you have any thoughts on Proust? Yes, hours and hours and hours of thoughts on Proust. We're actually due a new Proust video at the book club, which will be coming out very, very soon. Proust is one of those writers who I read for comfort and companionship during a difficult time in my life, so I'm very thankful for him. I also read Proust rather avidly whilst I was travelling a lot up and down the country. I've been immersed in his world for hours and hours and hours at a time and it's really bizarre when you look up because you've arrived at your train station and you've been reading Proust for three or four hours and you have to blink into the daylight and come stumbling back into the world. It's a disorienting experience and the real world feels less real than Proust's vivid, intoxicating world. Proust is wonderful. When I first picked him up, I was, I believe, 14 years old on work experience, and I didn't get him. But today I find Proust is a great one to read very, very slowly. And he's a great writer to twin with a journaling approach. So maybe once a week or every couple of weeks, you sit down with your journal and you have a page of Proust and you write around that page and of course you write around everything that you're reading. So you're reading a little bit of Proust alongside everything else that you're reading. But Proust is wonderful. He's, I think, one of the greatest writers of the 20th century and one of the greatest French writers of all time. What do you think is the greatest American classic? I would personally say Moby Dick. Thoughts on Ian McEwan, um, Atonement and Enduring Love are just two of his great novels and he's very much worth reading, he's great. Great Channel Ben, what are your favourite books about sport? I, I read a really good one, a biography about Muhammad Ali, I think it was called King of the World, I'll have to double check who wrote that one, but that was a good one. Favourite works from still living authors, Never Let Me Go by Kazuo Ishiguro, um, Lincoln and the Bardo by George Saunders. I'm currently really enjoying the works of Elena Ferrante, tremendous writer. Where should I start with philosophy? Plato's Republic. And after Plato's Republic, move on to Aristotle, and then get yourself Bertrand Russell's Guide to Philosophy. Big fat book and go through however you like, go through chronologically or go down the contents page and just pick out uh, philosophers that intrigue you and do marginalia in, in the notes and follow up Bertrand Russell's recommendations. Favourite films, TV series, directors. Favourite films, I love Akira Kurosawa as a director. I love Kurosawa's adaptation of Shakespeare's King Lear, the best adaptation I've ever seen, and he did not adapt Shakespeare's music. But the visual, the visual is 
awe-inspiring. If you haven't seen it, I definitely recommend it. Other favourite films... My, my personal favourite film is Groundhog Day because it seems a rather silly choice to a lot of people. People think that that, that displays that you don't know film very well. I love film and actually I got into film and then theatre before I got into books but Groundhog Day is a film with a really deep philosophy, one that can really positively impact your mindset. It's a fabulous film. I really recommend Groundhog Day. I also really love Barry Lyndon by Stanley Kubrick. Beautiful film. Beautiful film. I love Miyazaki. Yeah, Japanese animation. I love Spirited Away. I love Princess Mononoke. I also like many of the classic directors. I like Hitchcock. I like Orson Welles. I like Sergio Leone's Spaghetti Westerns. I like Bertolucci, Last Tango in Paris. I'm a big fan of Scorsese. I've loved everything that Scorsese has done. There's a great Antonioni film called The Passenger with Jack Nicholson that's well worth watching. I like a lot of the old black and white movies, It's a Wonderful Life, 12 Angry Men. Honestly, we should talk about film more in depth at some point because it really is one of my, my first artistic passions. As for TV series, I like loads of TV series. I love The Sopranos. I think The Sopranos is a masterpiece. I watched it when it first came out and I remember the reception when it first came out and we're kind of used to the anti-hero today, but when that came out, that was, that was phenomenal script writing. We hadn't really seen anything like that before. Um, if we're talking comedy, I think The Office is a comic masterpiece, both the British version and I love the US version as well, but they're quite different TV shows. Old TV series, I like The Twilight Zone. I used to watch that when I was younger and it kind of relaxes me to put on an episode of The Twilight Zone. That's always that's always good. I recently enjoyed The Hollow Crown. If you haven't seen The Hollow Crown, then you have yet to see some of the best adaptations of Shakespeare's history plays. It is marvellous. Marvellous. Start with Richard II and go on through. Go through Henry IV Part 1 and Part 2. Go through all the way to the second season and to Richard III. Really, really great storytelling there. Three albums that are not well known that you would recommend to check out. Not well known. All right, I'm gonna be a little bit provocative here and I'm going to pivot into some spoken word poetry albums. I'm not sure if these aren't well known. In fact, they're probably not. Uh, so I'm not sure if these are really exciting recommendations or not, but I would say look into the spoken word stuff of Jack Kerouac. Ferlinghetti, that's Lawrence Ferlinghetti, maybe start with a Coney Island of the Mind, and also Jim Morrison, An American Prayer. I love that album, and I don't see it getting the love I think it deserves. Senpai says, you can only choose one, Jane Austen versus George Eliot. Difficult. Now, if I had to give it to the more influential writer, I would have to choose Jane Austen. But if I had to pick the writer whose temperament I feel aligned with, the writer that I gravitate to, the writer that I, I read more frequently, then I might have to give it to George Eliot. Difficult question, though. What are your thoughts on John Williams and his works, specifically Stoner? I'm reading Stoner at the moment after a friend has urged me to do so. I'm enjoying it, so I'll have some thoughts on it very soon. I did read it before, many years ago, but it's basically a whole new book this time around. How can we apply literary theories on texts carefully? That's what my first year tutor at university urged us. He said, be careful. You pick your literary theory, but really, really be careful not to be too reductive. And there are lots of different literary theories, and if you go deep enough into them, you'll see that it does eventually become reductive. And he was particularly keen to emphasise that biographical readings can often be the most reductive of all. And we can often extrapolate things that aren't there, and we can often try to make things fit where they don't quite fit. So I would say tread carefully when it comes to literary theories. But hey, if you're using lots of different theories and pulling them in and tying them all up together, then that's fabulous. So have fun doing that. 
What do you think of the unbearable lightness of being and the catcher in the rye? Milan Kundera is a good writer. He's actually got quite a few works that are worth checking out. Both of those works are books that I, I loved when I was a bit younger. They do speak to a sort of younger attitude, don't they? Um, the Unbearable Lightness of Being, I've started rereading it again recently and I hope to do a podcast on it. The Catcher in the Rye, good stuff. I'll always think of that South Park episode where the boys were upset that the Catcher in the Rye wasn't quite as provocative as its controversial status might have led them to believe. Who was better as someone to read, Homer or Virgil and why? Well, we wouldn't have Virgil if it wasn't for Homer. Homer's influence is awe-inspiring and really, really difficult to adequately convey. Homer is a titan. Whoever this Homer was, whether it was an individual, whether it was a collection of writers, whether the Homer of the Odyssey was actually a young Mediterranean woman, as Samuel Butler believed, or not, Homer's influence cannot be understated. I'd give it to Homer. Having said that though, when I was younger, I opted to take Latin, GCSE, whilst doing my A-levels and I had to stay behind after school and I loved it, I loved it. And we had to translate Virgil and I really, really relished it. And I must say, I found for the longest time that Virgil was a lot easier to get swept up in. But as I got older, as I matured a little bit, I found that Homer took me by the throat and took me on a journey, a riveting journey that is endlessly instructive for how I live and how I think. But ultimately, you've named two of the most influential writers of all time. If you want to learn a little bit more about Virgil and Virgil's reach, there's a great book by Ernst Robert Curtius a really difficult book called European Literature and the Latin Middle Ages that I highly recommend you check out. Next question. What do you think about Harry Potter? I haven't read it since I was a child. I'm 27 now. Do you think I will enjoy it? Yeah, I haven't read Harry Potter for a very long time. I read all of them and when I did read them, I enjoyed it, but I do need to return to it and check it out. I would say that if you enjoyed it when you were younger, you might get a nice warm sense of nostalgia. So check out the books and let us know what you think of them, returning to them as an adult. Next question. Love your content. What is this Shakespeare work that you love the most? That's really difficult. I would have to give it to Hamlet because it seems to be the most inexhaustible work. It seems to be endless. I can always go to Hamlet and find something new and it evolves with me. Now, I've gone on record as saying that my personal favourite work was King Lear, and that's because it was something of an entrance piece, and I still think it's incredibly sublime. But I might have to give it to Hamlet. But very difficult question, very difficult. I'm currently in the process of making some content, ranking all of the works of Shakespeare and putting them in the rough order. And near the top, of course, we've got Hamlet, we've got Henry IV, we've got Antony and Cleopatra, we've got Macbeth, we've got King Lear, we've got A Midsummer Night's Dream, and As You Like It, and many more to choose from. Kylie asks, are there any Shakespeare movie adaptations you like? Yeah, the Michael Fassbender Macbeth, is really good. Directed by Justin Kurzel, I believe in 2015 with Marion Cotillard. I can't pronounce her name, but she was a very good Lady Macbeth. He was a terrific Macbeth and that whole movie was awe-inspiring. Highly, highly recommended. I also recommend the Hollow Crown series. That's good fun. Yeah, get through Shakespeare's histories with the Hollow Crown. Really, really good. Gets off to a good start with Patrick Stewart playing John of Gaunt. Wonderful, wonderful series of, uh, would we call them films or TV adaptations? And then Akira Kurosawa's Ran. Wonderful adaptation of King Lear, well worth seeing. I also really liked Shakespeare in Love as well. If you're a Shakespeare fan, I would say check it out. Yeah, it's good fun. Lord Sauron asks if I've read the Neapolitan Tetralogy by Elena Ferrante and also asks for a bookshelf tour. Yes, we're overdue, one of them, certainly. I'm currently reading Elena Ferrante because so many readers have recommended her works to me and I can see why. Elena Ferrante is 
fabulous. I have absolutely fallen in love with her writing and I cannot wait to read all of her works. Got the first book in her Neapolitan Quartet here and it really is wonderful. I would highly, highly recommend it. And the interesting thing about Elena Ferrante is there's this discussion ongoing at the moment as to who she is. What is the real identity? And some people have tried to dig things up and I think I don't think that's 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 on really. I don't think that's great because as many readers have said, it doesn't matter who this person is. They want to remain anonymous and in their anonymity, they have managed to touch us because when you read Elena Ferrante, it's raw, it's intimate, it's personal, it's truthful and it means a lot and it feels like we're in company with a friend. Does it matter who they are? I think no. Let that writer remain in anonymity, but as long as they keep putting these works out, fabulous. So I'm really excited uh, to read more of Elena Ferrante and I would recommend uh, anyone who hasn't picked her up yet to do exactly that. Eleanor asks, is there a writer regarded in great literature that you believe to be overrated? Uh, no one immediately comes to mind and it is important how we rate different writers and this idea of a canon the canon is essentially common consensus, the consensus of readers across time, those works that have endured. Who are those writers that we continue to pick up, that we continue to struggle through, and they continue to fight to remain relevant? And so if a writer is rated, then they're worth checking out. But of course, I mean, it depends what we mean by rated. Who is doing the rating and what is the criteria? Ultimately, the onus is on us to decide and then place them comparatively in the canon up against other writers. And that's gonna be a personal choice. So are there writers who are overrated? Personally, I can't think of any that immediately leap to mind. Sachit says, congratulations on hitting the 20K subscribers mark. Thank you very much. I hope the channel keeps growing and motivating readers across the globe. Thank you very much. Questions, who is your favorite playwright? Apart from Shakespeare, of course. I know you're a big fan of his work. Oscar Wilde, I love Oscar Wilde. Um, you said, I'm intrigued to know since you rarely talk about playwrights such as Arthur Miller or Harold Pinter, love from India. Oh, that's so great that you're enjoying the videos and reading along with us over in beautiful India. It's a country I've always wanted to go to with a really rich cultural heritage. So I'm, I feel very blessed that you're watching from India. Arthur Miller, have you listened to the one of the latest podcasts, uh, the Hardcore Literature podcast on Arthur Miller's Crucible? The Crucible was a great play Ostensibly, it's about Salem, the Salem witch hunts, but it's actually about McCarthyism and it remains relevant today. We did a whole show on Arthur Miller's Crucible, but Miller's got many great works uh, that are well worth checking out. Harold Pinter, I studied Pinter rather in depth at university and I would love to do some dedicated uh, content on Harold Pinter, who was incredibly influential. But after Shakespeare, I like Wilde, I like Chekhov, Anton Chekhov. I like Ibsen, I like Goethe. Goethe, who wasn't obviously just a playwright, he wrote in many different mediums, incredibly influential. Influential, um, but his Faust is wonderful. Who else is good? I'm currently enjoying Tennessee Williams, A Streetcar Named Desire, but I'm actually reading it instead of, instead of enjoying the Marlon Brando version. And Satchit also asks, which is your favorite play from the last 100 years? Oh, that's a difficult one. What's a good play? I like a lot of Mamet's stuff. So maybe Speed the Plow? Um, yeah, maybe maybe one of Mamet's plays would be a good choice. Next question. What other passions do you have apart from literature? I like going on hikes in the countryside. I love film. I love theatre. I love healthy living. I like good food. I like to see new places. I like music. I'm always listening to music. I actually was a fan of music or a lover of music in a really big way before I got to literature. So music essentially led me to literature in a sense. And when it comes to sports, I also like boxing 
and fighting, generally kickboxing, that sort of thing. I love the athleticism involved in boxing and I think it's a great sport. I used to run a lot, I was training for a marathon and I need to get back into my cardiovascular training. I also love animals, I absolutely adore animals. So those are a few things that I like aside from reading. Stefan says, congrats on the 20K subscribers, thank you. You mentioned that you write yourself. Can you share something of yours? Best regards. Yeah, I'll share something of mine. I'm currently writing very slowly two books and it's non-fiction. One of them is a work on Shakespeare and the other is a work on literature generally with different chapters dedicated to different principles. The chapter on Blood Meridian is all about about riding on through, riding through hell, riding through difficulty and what one finds when you emerge on the other side. And I've said over at the book club that I'll be sharing these chapters as works in progress along the way. So definitely I'd be very happy to, to do that. Next question. I'm trying to get my brain used to critically analysing literature. I haven't had any formal English lit education since school and even then I wasn't very good. I read as much as I can but I don't have the time to go back and take classes without the guidance of a teacher and I feel like I'm not developing my own skills for analysis. I've become a bit dependent on other people's opinions via YouTube videos, reviews and various articles to notice things and I struggle more with poetry because poetry review YouTube is very minimal. This is true. Do you have any advice for me to develop my skills for analysis? Also, any strategies for tackling long, epic and or difficult poems, i.e. Paradise Lost, The Odyssey, etc. For epics, slow and steady, one bite at a time, yeah? Bit by bit, just break it down. So you might tell yourself to read a book of Homer's Odyssey per week. Finding the right translation is important, there will always be purists who say you need to go and learn the language itself and there's an element of truth to that but you have to get into it first and fall in love with it deeply enough to enter that conversation. Find the right translation because that's the difference between voraciously inhaling this literature and putting it down but break it down. Break it down into manageable chunks. That's the best advice I can give you generally for difficult literature. Poetry reviews online are minimal and I love talking about poetry. I have many more videos planned when it comes to poetry, but it's not always the most popular thing. It's very niche for a reason. It's difficult. So it's because it's demanding, because it's difficult, you're going to attract less people who are watching it. And the people who are attracted are great readers and they love the subject, but that's part of the reason I think why there isn't as much content when it comes to poetry. As for developing your skills of analysis, there's not really a shortcut aside from simply writing and writing and writing every day and reading and reading and reading and entering discussion and simply talking about what you're reading and bringing it into your day-to-day -day life. And after a few years, if you do that consistently, your analytical skills will be very sharp. Okay, next question. Thanks for your videos. Wanted to ask about your advice in reading Shakespeare. Recently I read Macbeth, but English is not my first language. It's even my third language. Oh, very nice, you're trilingual. So I read it with a Persian translation. Some places where I had difficulty in understanding, so I would turn to Persian translation. I wanted to ask if you think it's a good idea to read Shakespeare's plays with a translation from our language or a modernised English version just for referring in difficult parts. Do you think we can maximise the pleasure of reading Shakespeare this way? Also, are you familiar with Persian poets and philosophers? And you name quite a few. I'm familiar with Hafez and Rumi. I'm not so familiar with some of the other writers that you've mentioned. Arabic literature is the area that I'm most excited to learn more about. So any recommendations you can provide for me will be much appreciated. It's something that I'm really consciously developing at the moment. Uh, I think Rumi's great. I think Hafez is great. And so I would assume that the other writers you've mentioned are good too. So. Shakespeare. Don't worry about reading it in translation. Obviously you want to read the original if it helps you get into the story. If a modernised version, fine. Consider it training wheels, but yeah, a, a translation's fine. Now I don't know what the Persian translations are like. I'm told that German translations are very, very good historically. And that's why we see that Shakespeare's had an incredible amount of influence on German writers, not just writers, composers, Mendelssohn, our notion 
Our romantic notion of a Midsummer Night's Dream is actually Mendelssohnian, and he's a German composer. There are some translations that are really good with Shakespeare, so I'd love to know how he translates into Persian. That's really cool. Definitely have a Persian translation if that helps. Have the original. If a modern translation helps you as well, but try to work towards the original and aim towards that any way you can. Yeah, just get there and keep doing the spade work. And you're obviously very intelligent, you're trilingual and you're reading Shakespeare and you're wondering if you should read the original or read an updated version. These are really intelligent questions. So I have no doubt in my mind that you will enjoy Shakespeare in the original very, very soon, which is something that a lot of native speakers cannot say. So I applaud your efforts, keep going. What you're doing is great. Keep enjoying that which endures and that which passes across borders. Because the great thing about Shakespeare, and this is why so many countries love Shakespeare, is the fact that it's not just the words. The words are powerful and musical, it's the sentiment. It's Shakespeare's depiction of humans and it is the themes that he deals with uh, that cross borders and endure. Great question, thank you. Okay, next question. Hi Ben, thank you for your wonderful work. You've truly changed my life for the better. Ah, oh, thank you so much. What do you think is the role of Greek mythology for someone who wants to get into classics? A lot of the classics, both poetry and literature, that I have read have multiple references to myths. For someone who's a complete beginner in Greek mythology, where should one start from? That's a really great question. If you read Homer, you'll notice lots of different allusions to mythology and the original listeners, the original recipients of the story would have, of course, recognized those allusions. It was shared knowledge, wasn't it? It was referring to a mythology that was shared. And of course, we cannot assume today that we're going to know all the different gods and goddesses, the different deities, but we also don't need to. And I think if you're reading something like Homer's Odyssey or you're reading the Iliad and you find yourself intrigued to follow something up, then absolutely you should do that. But it's not imperative and you can simply enjoy the story, enjoy the narrative, how it's being told, what's being said. Having said that though, there are many great guides. Robert Graves has done a great job with his works and more recently Stephen Fry has done a tremendous job with his works too. So I would recommend Stephen Fry personally. Okay, as someone who cannot write in the margins due to my handwriting and overall perfectionism of never knowing what to write, how would one go about using notebooks as an alternative? Say a notebook for all of Shakespeare's sonnets like you have previously mentioned or a notebook per novel. Love your content. Thank you very much. Now, one approach that I would recommend is treating it like you would a journal, putting the date at the top and then having, if we're gonna use the example of a Shakespearean sonnet, have the sonnet before you and ask yourself very simply what you make of it. What is being said in the sonnet? What is the message of the sonnet? What is the speaker saying to the young man, for example? Let's say you're in the procreation sequence, the first 17 sonnets. What is he urging him to do? And how do you feel about that? So in the first 17 sonnets, he's trying to convince that young man to procreate and to pass on his genes, to marry, start a family, have a legacy left behind him because remaining single, he will prove none. That's one of the conceits from the sonnets, isn't it? And each sonnet is like a beautiful room where Shakespeare flexes a new metaphor or a new field of imagery. One sonnet he's talking about music, for example. The eighth sonnet is where he introduces the field of music. And ask yourself, is it convincing? Are you convinced? Do you have a visceral gut reaction to what is being said? Do you agree? and try to extrapolate it to your life. Does it move you at all? And it doesn't have to. But is there anything? It could be a stray line, it could be an image, it could be an idea. It doesn't even really have to be connected with what one thinks the sonnet is actually about. Does it scaffold on to anything else that you've read? Whilst you're reading other novels, for example. Things that have happened in your life. Does it make you think about anything. So treat it as an opportunity to do a little bit of reflection 
and to think about your life generally. Think about how you treat yourself, think about your interpersonal relationships, think about your job and your passions, and examine your different beliefs and get it down on paper. And sometimes we find ourselves hesitant to dirty a blank page because we think it needs to be profound from the get-go. We don't want to commit something to paper that is going to be frivolous, but very often insight will grow out of those comments that we think initially are just throwaway. They're not resonant, but they are. We keep writing around it and around it and around it, and then we get into the heart of the matter, which is whatever is on our minds right now. And we keep doing that over time, and then we have a book that is basically a physicalization of our personal growth, and we can mark how we've grown over a period of time. And it's very personal, and it doesn't have to be perfect, and it can be dirty, and it can look any way you want it to look. But ultimately, and this is frequently my advice, don't take it too seriously, because if you take it too seriously, you might get a little bit hung up and you'll never get into it. But embrace frivolity, yeah? Embrace play and write into yourself and the book you're reading. And I think you'll surprise yourself. Just give yourself license to run away with it. Give yourself license to write something that isn't profound and you will find something poignant if you keep writing. I'm sure you will. Okay, so we're gonna leave it there for today. Thank you to everyone who asked me a question. I'm sorry if I didn't get to your question. There are many questions that are going to be dedicated videos. I've saved all of your questions and I'm gonna try and answer them in some capacity in future videos. But there are definitely many questions that will be dedicated videos themselves. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you for watching, thank you for reading along, thank you so much for being part of the discussion. I really appreciate all of you, I'm grateful for you all. And what more can I say other than thank you? Thank you for being here and deep reading these great books with me. I hope you have a lovely day and happy reading everybody. Bye bye for now.